Global News would like to greet you and everyone. Today, we will help you update important international events, while bringing multi-dimensional perspectives and deep reflections on current issues. Topic going on in the world. Right now are the main news that will be in the program. Trump sought to hoodwink voters with porn star payment, prosecutor tells jury. U.S. military peer temporarily removed from Gaza coast for repairs. South Africans vote in most competitive elections since end of apartheid. A New York prosecutor told jurors that the hush money payment at the heart of former President Donald Trump's criminal trial was an attempt to hoodwink the American voter during the 2016 election, as lawyers made their closing arguments on Tuesday. Prosecutor Joshua Steinglass said the $130,000 payment that ensured porn star Stormy Daniels would not discuss an alleged sexual encounter was part of a broad effort to bury stories that might have damaged his first White House bid. We'll never know if this effort to hoodwink the American voter impacted the election, but that's something we don't need to prove, Steinglass said. Jurors could begin deliberating as soon as Wednesday in the first criminal trial of a U.S. president. The trial was due to resume at 10 a.m., 14 o'clock GMT, with the judge issuing instructions to the jury. Trump, 77, faces 34 felony counts of falsifying business documents to cover up the payment to Daniels. He has pleaded not guilty, denies ever having sex with Daniels and appeared to be unimpressed with Steinglass's closing argument. Blanche drew a reprimand from the judge overseeing the trial for telling jurors the evidence was insufficient to send Trump to prison. Jurors are tasked with assessing guilt or innocence while judges determine punishment of those found guilty. Justice Juan Merchant told jurors after they returned from lunch to ignore that statement. That comment was improper and you must disregard it, he said before prosecutors began their closing argument. The charges brought against Trump are misdemeanors on their own but prosecutors elevated them to felonies on the grounds that Trump was trying to cover up his unlawful efforts to promote his candidacy. Blanche said prosecutors had not proven that there had been any underlying crime to cover up. Trump faces three other criminal prosecutions as well, but none is likely to go to trial before the election. He has pleaded not guilty in all of the cases and called them an effort by Biden's Democratic allies to hobble his presidential bid. Israel's military denied striking a tent camp west of Rafah on Tuesday after Gaza health authorities said Israeli tank shelling had killed at least 21 people there, in an area Israel has designated a civilian evacuation zone. Earlier, defying an appeal from the International Court of Justice, Israeli tanks advanced to the heart of Rafah for the first time after a night of heavy bombardment, while Spain, Ireland and Norway officially recognized a Palestinian state a move that further deepened Israel's international isolation. The United States, Israel's closest ally, reiterated its opposition to a major Israeli ground offensive in Rafah but said it did not believe such an operation was underway. Describing the U.S. view of what would constitute a major offensive in Rafah, White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby told reporters that it would involve large numbers of troops in columns and formations in some sort of coordinated maneuver against multiple targets on the ground. A person familiar with the issue said that Israel delivered its latest ceasefire and hostage release proposal to Qatar, and Qatar was to provide it to Hamas on Tuesday. Hamas has said talks are pointless unless Israel ends its offensive in Rafah. More than 36,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's offensive, Gaza's health ministry says. Israel launched its air and ground war after Hamas-led militants attacked southern Israeli communities on October 7, killing around 1,200 people and seizing more than 250 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Israel says it wants to root out the last major intact formations of Hamas fighters hunkered down in Rafah and rescue hostages it says are being held in the area. A U.S. military-built pier off Gaza's coast is being temporarily removed after a part of the structure broke off, the Pentagon said on Tuesday, in the latest blow to efforts to deliver humanitarian aid to Palestinians. The pier was announced by U.S. President Joe Biden in March and involved the military assembling the floating structure off the coast. Estimated to cost $320 million for the first 90 days and involve about 1,000 U.S. service members, it went into operation two weeks ago. Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh said a portion of the pier had separated and that the pier would be towed over the next 48 hours to Ashdod Port in Israel for repairs.
Singh added the pier would take over a week to repair and then return to its place off the coast of Gaza. U.S. officials, who spoke on condition of anonymity, told Reuters earlier on Tuesday that bad weather was believed to be the reason that the part of the pier had broken off. Since the pier began operations, the United Nations has transported 137 trucks of aid from the pier, the equivalent of 900 metric tons, said a UN World Food Program spokesperson. The Biden administration said on Tuesday it was closely monitoring the probe into a deadly Israeli airstrike it called tragic, but that the recent deaths in Rafah didn't constitute a major ground operation there that crosses any U.S. red lines. The Israelis have said this is a tragic mistake, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby told reporters at the White House, when asked about whether the events over the weekend qualified as the type of death and destruction U.S. officials have warned could result in the withholding of more aid to Israel. The U.S. doesn't have a measuring stick here or a quota, Kirby said. We've also said we don't want to see a major ground operation in Rafah that would really make it hard for the Israelis to go after Hamas without causing extensive damage and potentially a large number of deaths. We have not seen that yet, he said, noting that Israel's operations were mostly in a corridor on the outskirts of Rafah. The State Department said on Tuesday that as soon as it saw reports of Sunday's Rafah incident, Washington expressed deep concern to Israel and urged an investigation, which Israel has promised. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller told reporters that Washington will be closely watching Israel's probe, but Israel's military operations so far in Rafah have not been as large-scale as those in central or northern Gaza. Global leaders have expressed horror at the fire in a designated humanitarian zone of Rafah, where families uprooted by fighting elsewhere had sought shelter. More than 36,000 Palestinians have been killed in Israel's offensive, Gaza's health ministry says. Israel launched its air and ground war after Hamas-led militants attacked southern Israeli communities on October 7, killing around 1,200 people and seizing more than 250 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. Georgia's parliament voted on Tuesday to override a presidential veto of a bill on foreign agents that has plunged the South Caucasus country into crisis, ignoring criticism from the West which says the legislation is authoritarian and Russian-inspired. The vote to ignore the objections of Georgian President Salome Zurabishvili, whose powers are mostly ceremonial, sets the stage for the Speaker of Parliament to sign the bill into law in the coming days. In an address after the vote, Zurabishvili, who is trying to broker an alliance of opposition parties to contest parliamentary elections on October 26, said ruling party lawmakers had chosen Russian slavery and encouraged people to vote them out at the polls. The dispute about the draft law has come to be seen as a key test of whether Georgia, for three decades among the most pro-Western of the Soviet Union's successor states, would maintain its Western orientation or pivot instead to Russia. The bill would require organizations receiving more than 20 percent of their funding from overseas to register as agents of foreign influence, while also introducing punitive fines for violations, as well as onerous disclosure requirements. The Georgian government says the bill is necessary to promote transparency and to stop what it describes as a plot by Western countries to drag Georgia into a war with Russia. Thousands of opponents of the bill gathered outside the fortress-like parliament building during voting on Tuesday for the latest in a series of demonstrations that are among the largest in Georgia since it won independence from Moscow in 1991 as the Soviet Union crumbled. Protester Georgi Amzashvili said lawmakers who had voted to override the president's veto were the most treacherous people in our history. South Africans vote on Wednesday in the most competitive election since the end of apartheid, with opinion polls suggesting the African National Congress, ANC, will lose its parliamentary majority after 30 years in government. Then led by Nelson Mandela, the ANC swept to power in South Africa's first multiracial election in 1994 and has won a majority in national elections held every five years since then, though its share of the vote has gradually declined. If it falls short of 50% this time, the ANC will have to make a deal with one or more smaller parties to govern uncharted and potentially choppy waters for a young democracy that has so far been utterly dominated by a single party. However, the ANC is still on course to win the largest share of the vote, meaning that its leader President Cyril Ramaphosa is likely to remain in office, unless he faces an internal challenge if the party's performance is worse than expected. Voter dissatisfaction over high rates of unemployment and crime, 
frequent power blackouts and corruption in party ranks lies behind the ANC's gradual fall from grace. More than 27 million South Africans are registered to vote at over 23,000 polling stations that will be open from 0500 GMT to 19 o'clock GMT. Voters will elect provincial assemblies in each of the country's nine provinces, and a new national parliament which will then choose the next president. Former President Jacob Zuma is backing a new party, called Yumkanta We Sizwi, MK, named after the ANC's former armed wing. Zuma, who was forced to quit as president in 2018 after a string of scandals, has enduring influence, particularly in his home province of KwaZulu-Natal. The election commission is expected to start releasing partial results within hours of polling stations closing. The commission has seven days to announce final results, but at the last election, also held on a Wednesday, it did so on a Saturday. The recent news also ended our global news program. Thank you for your attention and follow-up. Please continue to accompany us on our journey to discover the world situation, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any new information. Goodbye and see you again.